Good morning. So, um, we are ready to move on. So we just completed uh, midterm number two, and we're ready to head uh, into chapter 39. So, um, here we go. So chapter 39 is, um, I think it's titled just atoms. Um, so, or the physics of atoms. So, uh, we've been playing around with quantum physics, and we've talked about, you know, properties of electrons and protons and neutrons and photons. Uh, and now we're ready to uh, take a closer look, a, 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 a realistic look, at, at the properties of atoms and how we understand how atoms function quantum mechanically. So we had looked at the Bohr model, and what was the main feature of the Bohr model? Yeah, it was wrong. So um, it gave the right energy formula, which is kind of miraculous, but um, it, it really conceptually and uh, in terms of basic physical principles, it, 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 was all, it was all wrong. And so now we've got to come back and look at atoms the right way. Uh, so the first thing, let's see, um, atoms uh, and molecules, let's just throw molecules in there. We'll be looking at those in the next chapter. But if we think of, um, what are atoms and molecules made out of? And what they're made out of are nuclei and electrons. So when people say, hey, everything's made out of atoms, I always feel like, mm, it's, that's a little confusing, I guess, or it could be. Uh, maybe a better way to think about that is everything's made out of nuclei and electrons. Because what we find when we're running chemical reactions and, or if we're analyzing the properties of different materials is that uh, the electrons move around. And so the electrons, and that's what we're going to find out in this chapter, so there's a, a, a set of quantum states for the electrons, but electrons can be pulled out of those states or electrons can be placed in those quantum states. So rather than, you know, when people say everything's made out of atoms and molecules, it kind of makes it, to me at least, makes it seem like, hey, those atoms are just intact. But in reality, electrons are moving around all the, all the time. So maybe, I mean, my preferred way, I guess, of thinking about the properties of materials is, hey, it's a bunch of nuclei, and the nuclei are kind of embedded in these electrons. So um, again, I, I feel like that's um, a sensible way to, to, to think about this. Um, now, if we start looking at atoms, what we could do is we could go back and think in terms of uh, hydrogen. So throw out any thoughts of that Bohr model. The Bohr model never happened. Uh, just completely put that out of your mind. Uh, and let's go back and say that what we're doing in this chapter is we're actually going to use quantum mechanics or quantum physics to understand what's going on inside atoms. Now when we say understand what's going on inside atoms, what we're really going to be looking at are the electrons. So again, it's kind of misleading to say the quantum mechanics of atoms. We're really looking at the electron states, the electron quantum states. Because the nuclei, for the most part, we're, we're going to find out, or we're just going to state this up front, uh, the nuclei are so small and so compact, we really have to look at those uh, nuclei separately. and and. Nuclei are much more difficult to disrupt. That involves nuclear reactions. Now, we, we're going to be looking at that in future chapters. But for now, we're going to treat the nuclei as just point charges. So for the purposes of studying atoms, how the electrons move around inside atoms and molecules, the nuclei are just kind of point charges. And that's what we've done for hydrogen here, is we've drawn a diagram of hydrogen. And there's a proton. Um, we'll say this is the simplest version of hydrogen. 
and uh, we'll just say that there's a proton uh, placed at that location. Now, how are we going to represent the electron then? And uh, what it turns out is that the electron is going to get represented by some kind of wave function. So, um, now the proton also has its own wave function. But, um, Again, we're going to save that for some later chapters. We're not going to worry about wave functions for that right now. But what we're going to do is say that the electron is going to have some wave function. Now, because these positively charged nuclei represent a point, and they represent most of the mass, 99.9 something percent of the mass is in the nuclei, in atoms, to a very good approximation, what we can do is we can think of the proton, or, the, or the, the nuclei in general, as being located, kind of fixed, at the center of a coordinate system. And so the electron, then, uh, can be represented by a wave function in spherical coordinates. Now, you guys have all been working with spherical coordinates in your calculus classes, so here's a perfect application uh, of using spherical coordinates in order to represent the wave function uh, for the electron quantum states um, in atoms. And we're going to start off by looking at hydrogen. Now, I drew kind of this circular, uh, spherical, I guess we got to think three-dimensionally here, kind of a spherical uh, shape to represent where the electron wave function primarily is located. But remember, this is quantum physics. So what we're going to do is, we're going to find wave functions. Now, the electron wave functions are all going to be spread out. I always, I always kind of take issue when people say, oh, atoms and molecules, mostly empty space. Because really, if you start sampling atoms and molecules and, and try to locate particles, uh, what you find is that the electron's influence, the electron's effect, the electron's wave function, is really spread out. So, I, I would prefer thinking of it's kind of the electrons are big and bulky, and at least their wave functions are big and bulky. And so those electron wave functions end up filling up all that space. So, you know, if something is solid and we're pushing against it, kind of like we saw in chapter 38, what you're bumping up against are those electron wave functions. And uh, in order to compress a solid material, it takes a lot of force, it takes a lot of work, a lot of energy to transfer and to compress it. And that's because we're forcing electrons into smaller and smaller regions. And in chapter 38, what we found was any particle that you pack into smaller regions, the kinetic energy of those quantum states is going to go up. So yeah, you can think of solids are non-compressible because you're pushing up against the electron wave functions three-dimensionally. Now that's not an issue for the nuclei, because the nuclei are already just these point charges. Uh, their wave functions are much, much more compact. So familiar material, it's the electrons. Big and bulky, uh, taking up all that space. Now, if we're going to use quantum physics to describe what's going on with these wave functions, I guess that means we've got to bring back Schrodinger's equation. Now, um, as, as terrifying as that might be, uh, let's go back. And how many dimensions do we want to work in? And this has definitely got to be three-dimensional. So um, why the big emphasis in Chapter 38? You know, I kept uh, emphasizing we want to actually look at this three-dimensional model. We don't want to uh, we, we spend a lot of time looking at it. Because that's going to give us more realistic uh, representations of what these electron quantum states are really like. So it, it, it kind of prepared us uh, for, well, for chapter 39 and beyond. So as we look at these later chapters, uh, we already have some experience with the Schrodinger equation. Now, if we look at um, this hydrogen atom, we're going to start with our starting point for the Schrodinger equation. Remember, starting off with the Schrodinger equation, um, the Schrodinger equation is a partial differential equation. It's based on energy. 
So we start off by saying uh, the energy of this quantum state includes the electron's kinetic energy. Now this is specifically the electron's kinetic energy. And then this is the potential energy of interaction of the electron with the nucleus. So we're leaving out the nuclear effects here. We're not including nuclear kinetic energies. Those turn out to be really small. So we can focus in on the electron kinetic energies and the interaction energy between the electrons and the nucleus. So that's how we approach this. Now remember, when we were developing the Schrodinger equation back in chapter 38, what we said was um, we have operators that represent momentum and energy. And so to get my momentum operators, we're going to rewrite We're going to rewrite the kinetic energies. So we're going to rewrite the kinetic energies in terms of momentum, momentum squared. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write the potential energy as k e squared divided by r. So this piece right here, what does that look like? You go, ah, it looks like kinetic energy, right? We saw that back in chapter 38. This is an operator. Uh, oh, it's not an operator yet. We've got to get the operators in there. But that's going to be our kinetic energy. Why is this the potential energy? And so remember, uh, potential energies, electromagnetic potential energies, uh, the dominant effect. So we, we, we should say this really quickly, too. Uh, this is not the only effect going on electromagnetically. So the electrons, protons, and neutrons they all have magnetic fields. Yeah, even the neutrons. We'll, we'll talk about that more later. But electrons, protons, neutrons, they all have magnetic interactions. It turns out that the energy of those magnetic interactions within atoms and molecules is actually pretty small. So we, we're going to neglect that for now. We're going to include the biggest effect from electromagnetics. And that would be uh, the electromagnetic potential energy that you guys learned back in physics 4b. Uh, which was K, Q1, Q2, where uh, K is the electromagnetic force constant, uh, 8.99, 10 to the 9th, newtons, meters squared, coulomb squared. Ooh, that would make, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That would make Q Q1. I'm going to say is the proton, Q2 is the electron. So Q1 is the proton, Q2 is the electron. That means that the charges are plus E and minus E. And so when I substitute those in, that's what I'm going to get. Now, in our coordinate system that we've set up, what we're saying is, hey, the nucleus, let's just think of it as being fixed right at the center of the coordinate system. And so that says that Wherever the electron is located, uh, R could be small, R could be big. But the potential energy is going to be given by that expression. There's an overall minus sign because it's an attractive force. So uh, minus signs on potential energies tell us that the force is going to be attractive. All right. So we're, we're kind of getting set up with our Schrodinger equation. Now the next part of this then would be to say that uh, there's energy uh, times a wave function. And um, we want to make that wave function three-dimensional. But what's happening right now is this. Notice that the momentum is written as px, py, and pz. Uh, what that does for us, let me go ahead and, and write this out. I'll write this as r, theta, and phi. Now, when I substitute in the differential operators, what this is going to become is minus h bar squared over 2m uh, second partial with respect to x, second partial with respect to y, second partial with respect to z. Now, i got to carry out all of those partial derivatives on the wave function. So here is the wave function back again. And then finally, uh, the potential energy term, we just take the potential energy multiplied by the uh, 
wave function. All right, so as advertised, what we're going to do is, um, we've never looked at atoms before, right? I don't ever remember looking at atoms before, because what we needed to do was to take basic quantum physics principles. Um, that means deriving a Schrodinger equation that uh, applies for the electrons inside atoms. And uh, we're going to start off with hydrogen. That makes things easier. I only have one electron to keep track of. One electron means that I only have one potential energy expression. If I had two electrons, that would get a lot more complicated. With two electrons, I would need potential energies between electron one in the nucleus, electron two in the nucleus, and I'd have to have a repulsive term between the two electrons. So two electrons is like, you know, a, a hundred thousand times harder to solve for than one electron. So, uh, and that's, that's why we're looking at the one electron solutions here. So this is our Schrodinger equation for one electron inside an atom. And uh, we do have this issue going on here. These partial derivatives are in rectangular coordinates. So what we got to do is we got to switch out of uh, rectangular coordinates and switch over into spherical coordinates. When we do that, the math gets more complicated. So um, let's see what happens. I'm just going to write this down. Um, I guess I got to clear some room on the board for this. See if it will fit. Turns out that this series of partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, uh, when we switch over and write them in terms of spherical coordinates, becomes the following. Uh, what we're going to end up with is 1 over r squared partial r squared partial plus 1 over r squared, 1 over sine squared theta, partial sine theta, partial, plus 1 over r squared, 1 over sine, this one's not squared, I know, it gets, uh, It gets really, well, complicated. It just means we have to uh, step through this very carefully. All right, so what we've done is we've replaced those sets of, of second partial derivatives uh, in rectangular coordinates with their equivalent in spherical coordinates. But as you found out in your calculus classes and, and what we're running into here, the expressions are a lot more complicated in spherical coordinates than they were in rectangular coordinates. But, but that's what we're going to need to do. So um, that's the general formula of the Schrodinger equation from which uh, all of the um, wave functions for hydrogen that we're going to look at in this chapter, they are all solutions to that one differential equation. Okay, so it's three-dimensional, it's keeping track of all the different possible uh, quantum states, what are, what's their energy, um, that's, that's what everything derives from. So uh, kind of remarkable, it's worth pausing and taking a look at this and go, really? That's kind of everything right there. Uh, as far as um, the way you would start out uh, in terms of um, applying quantum physics to electron states inside atoms and molecules. Now, the question then, the important question here, is, uh, God, do we have to solve that? And the answer is no, you don't have to. What you do have to do is the same thing we did in chapter 38. And that means if you're given a solution. If somebody tells you what the solution is to this differential equation, are you able to go through and uh, verify that it really is a solution? 
Okay, so that's that's what you need to be able to do. Now, the second thing, the second simplification here, is that uh, <clears throat> a lot. A lot of the complication is the part of the differential equation that includes the theta and the phi. So those are angular dependences, and uh, for the most part, um, we're not going to look at that. We will talk about it from time to time, but as far as carrying out actual mathematics, uh, this part is, we're probably not going to come back and look at the detail, for, for better or worse. Well, it would be really interesting to do, but it's, it's pretty involved. So most of the time, what we're going to be looking at is just the radial portion So the, for the most part, we're just going to be looking at the radial uh, dependence of the Schrodinger equation. All right, fair enough, I hope. Um, all right, so that's what the Schrodinger equation is telling us uh, in terms of the wave function. Now, let's step back. We're going to come back and, and look at actually solving this uh, Schrodinger equation. But let's do this, first of all. Uh, let's see what, what results we get. So um, from this, what we find out, ooh, and I guess, I guess we do have to make some room for all this. All right, I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Pretend it never happened. It turns out that when we take uh, the Schrodinger equation and apply it to electrons inside atoms, we're going to get a series of quantum states. Each of those quantum states is going to be represented by some kind of a wave function, which is a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, when we look at the quantum numbers, So as you remember, back in chapter 38, uh, typically when we were looking at these quantum states, we were interested in finding out what were the energies uh, of the individual quantum states. How much energy did each of the quantum states correspond to? And um, it turns out that we're going to see the same thing here in terms of spherical coordinates. Now, before we go any farther, I've, I've mentioned spherical coordinates like a bunch of times. And probably what we should do is ask ourselves, what does r theta and phi actually mean? So um, let's say that we have a location in space. Uh, I'm going to place it right here and say that here is the origin of my coordinate system. Well, R is just telling us how far we are from the origin. So I, I believe calculus is still consistent with that. Maybe they're using rho. Did they use R? Did they use rho? Not sure. I know when I was in college, which was a few years ago, uh, the math and the uh, physics convention for spherical coordinates, if I remember right, agreed. Uh, since then, I think math has found a probably a, a more intuitive. Physics is kind of stuck with the uh, convention that we've been working with for a long time. In any case, this value of r tells us how far we are from the uh, center of the coordinate system. So uh, what we've got then is we have to identify where the theta value is going to be and where the phi value is going to be in our coordinate system. So uh, theta is actually measured from uh, the z-axis. So if you think of this as being the z-axis here, and then this is an xy plane, uh, what we've got now is uh, theta is telling us how far we are from the z-axis. So uh, what we've got then is, is it's kind of like latitude, but instead of starting at the equator and measuring away from the equator, 
it's starting at one of the poles and then measuring from there all the way to the other pole. So the possible values of theta go from 0 to pi, or 0 to 180 degrees. So that's what theta is going to be measured in terms of. And then if I look in the xy plane, so let's get a top view of this. If we say this is x and this is y, again, here's where r is located. C is telling us how far from the x-axis we're located. So, um, so that's it. That's our convention for r, theta, and uh, phi. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll see how this works when we start doing uh, probability calculations. What we want to be able to do is get the wave functions determined uh, from the wave function, square those, and get the probabilities. And then once we have the probabilities, we can carry out spherical integrations in three dimensions and find out what the probability uh, functions look like. All right, so the quantum numbers that we get from carrying this out, turns out that we get three quantum numbers uh, associated with the three dimensions. If you think back to the three-dimensional examples, that we used uh, back in chapter 38. We had nx, ny, and nz. Well, now we're in spherical coordinates, so it looks a little different. Uh, the quantum numbers that we get are, well, this is what we call them. We call them n, l, and m sub l. And again, it comes from solving the differential equation. All right, let's look at those uh, quantum numbers. Uh, remember, where these quantum numbers are coming from is from solving the Schrodinger equation. So there was that enormous equation that we had up on the board written in terms of uh, spherical coordinates, r, theta, and phi. Uh, we've now solved it, uh, and what we have, we've found is that the solutions, the wave functions, let me write that down, so what we're looking for are the electron wave functions that uh, correspond to the possible quantum states of an electron in hydrogen. For right now, it's just hydrogen. We'll see that we can extend our results to the entire periodic table uh, in many ways. Uh, in any case, so we're going to say there's a wave function. The subscripts on this wave function now are in terms of uh, n, l, and m sub l. And so, um, yeah, let's take a look and see what each of these quantum numbers is telling us. Uh, the n is going to give us information about the energy of the state. So we're going to say this is our energy quantum number. And it turns out that the energy formula that we end up with is the same formula that Bohr ended up with by making all those wrong assumptions. But we're going to say, finally, we've solved it using quantum physics principles, and this is the energy formula you get using quantum physics principles, uh, solving from the Schrodinger equation. So the quantum numbers here, uh, little n is right there. This is um, Planck's constant, the electromagnetic force constant, the, the charge on the electron, the mass on the electron. And uh, n can be equal to any integer number. And so there's going to be a series of different quantum states. And we could do an energy diagram here. Just a reminder of how energy works in that. Now, uh, back in chapter 38, when we were looking at um, when we were looking at a cubic region, a three-dimensional cube, we said that outside there was this potential that was infinity, infinitely large. But um, that's not really what's happening with the atoms. In an atom, uh, when the electron completely separates from the nucleus, that corresponds to zero energy. Our definition of zero potential energy is when you take two charges and move them very far away from each other. 
So in our energy diagram for hydrogen, what's going to happen is we're going to have a reference of uh, zero energy. Zero EV are the units we're going to make use of here. Now if I plug into this formula, what I find out is that there is a lowest possible energy state for the electron in hydrogen, and it comes in with an energy of 13.6 EV negative. And so that's a binding energy. Uh, in atoms and molecules, we have binding energies, which mean, hmm, if I wanted to remove the electron, separate it from the nucleus, separate it from the proton in this case, it would take 13.6 EV. Now, typically, the way we would do that is you'd send in a high energy photon. So, a photon coming in with that much energy, at least that much energy, would be able to remove an electron from the lowest possible energy state and completely bring it beyond kind of this ionization boundary that we have set up. All right. So that's where the energy uh, quantum state one is, and the energy for quantum state one. Where's quantum state two? And uh, quantum state two would come from putting two in for the value of n. Now, it turns out that the way this formula works, energy state two is actually most of the way towards ionization. So it's like three-fourths of the way uh, towards the ionization, and if we look at energy state 3, and energy state 4, and energy state 5, we find that interesting pattern. I won't write all these down, there's an infinite number of them. Uh, but we find kind of that pattern of going, oh yeah, the way the energy states are spaced, um, what's happening here is that uh, there's big gaps at first, uh, this is clearly the most binding energy. If the electron somehow were to find its way into state two, eh, it wouldn't be so tightly attached to the proton anymore. State number three, four, five, it's even less binding energy when we get to those locations. Okay, so that's something we've kind of seen before. And now we've derived it using you know, full-blown quantum physics and uh, this is the energy formula we're ending up with. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, this is something uh, that we've worked with in our other quantum examples. We've looked at energy in these quantum states. Now what we're going to find is that not only is energy an important quantity, but also angular momentum. Now, angular momentum, I don't know, you think back to physics 4A when we first introduced angular momentum, and it was like, yeah, it was something kind of rotational, and angular momentum's a conserved quantity. Uh, when you think about conserved quantities in physics, let's see, we got energy, we got linear momentum, and in the special relativity chapter, we found out they were really part of the same package. Uh, but then we've got this other conservation property, angular momentum. And in quantum mechanics, angular momentum plays an important role. So just like there are operators for energy and operators for momentum, there are operators for angular momentum. And when we work in specifically spherical coordinates, we find out that angular momentum for a central potential, something where I've got something at the center pulling everything inwards, in those cases, angular momentum is conserved. So those become important parts of the quantum states. Now the angular momentum that we are referring to here is known as orbital angular momentum. Now in quantum physics, there's no trajectory that the electron is following. Uh, so instead, uh, the orbital angular momentum we're talking about has to do with the shape of the electron distribution around the nucleus. We'll see how that works. Uh, so we kind of have to do this one step at a time. But, so we're going to have quantum states that are characterized by quantum number n that tells us energy, quantum numbers L and M sub L 
that tell us about angular momentum. Now, angular momentum is a vector. So um, it's got a possibility of three components to it. And the way quantum physics uh, provides information to us for angular momentum, I don't know if you guys remember, big L stands for angular momentum. And uh, the angular momentum formula works out to be L, L plus 1, all square rooted times h bar. So uh, let me make a little room here. So um, remember back in the Bohr model that Bohr had assumed that each one of the possible quantum states had an integer value of angular momentum. Turns out to be wrong. Uh, what happens is they each have values of angular momentum given by this kind of crazy formula. So uh, the possible values of L are 0, 1, 2. Uh, so L can take on any integer value but it can never be as large as n minus 1. N mi well, n minus 1 is the, the largest value it can have. So what that's saying is, uh, I guess i got to get these energy states back. If we look at, uh, let's say the n equals 1 state, the n equals 2 state, the n equals 3 state. What's going to happen then is, uh, for the different angular momentum values, I'm going to write these as L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2. We'll just do the first couple of energy levels here. Uh, if I'm at energy level 1, then the only possible value for angular momentum's quantum number is 0. And that actually tells me that in the lowest energy state, there is no angular momentum. There is no orbital angular momentum in this lowest quantum state. Now, when I move up to energy level 2, now there's actually a couple of possibilities here. It turns out that it, it's possible there are states which have no angular momentum, but there are also states that have one unit of angular momentum. Now, it's, quite, it's not quite one unit because I have to plug that quantum number into here. That would become L, L plus 1, eh, and then i got to square root it. That would be like square root of 2 times the angular momentum. So uh, when I get up to energy level 2, there's two possibilities for angular momentum. When I get up to level 3, there's three possible values, and the pattern continues. So what happens is, instead of, um, I know I keep referring back to the Bohr model, but Bohr, Bohr's model was only looking at, well, it was looking at energy and angular momentum. And it said that at each energy level, there was a certain amount of angular momentum that matched kind of the n value. And now we're saying that's not the case. n and l are distinct quantities. And uh, the pattern of l enables there to be more than one energy state at each level. And what we're going to see is this added complexity in the angular momentum of these quantum states um, well, anyway, what we're going to find is that that predicts the periodic table. So we'll see how that works. We'll bring the periodic table in here at some point. Uh, but anyway, we've got orbital angular momentum, and it's given by this formula. Now, what this is telling us, we said this was a vector. What this is giving us is, in vector language, it's telling us how much angular momentum we have. So we think of this as a magnitude. It's an amount of orbital angular momentum. Now there's another, angular, uh, another quantity here, another quantum number. And uh, it's m sub l. And it turns out that m sub l specifically tells us how much angular momentum we have along one axis. So. Um, In vector language, that would mean that uh, big L, or little l, I guess, little l, 
is telling us about um, the magnitude, the amount of angular momentum, but it doesn't give us any directional information. M sub L tells us how much angular momentum is in a particular direction, and that's kind of like, uh, it's a little bit of directional information about the angular momentum. So we, we have two quantum numbers. We don't have three. Um, to completely specify uh, the angular momentum, what we would need to do is have three quantum numbers for that, but we don't. So there's a little uncertainty. There's a little range of possible values that are allowed for quantum mechanically when we are looking at angular momentum in a system. All right, so uh, N, L, M sub L, uh, those are the quantum numbers that we're going to be working from, and um, we'll come back and we'll be, um, we'll be using some of those in some of our examples, trying to decide maybe we do want to go ahead and, and push this a little farther right now. Uh, let me do that. Um, Here's our hydrogen atom. I'm going to erase this for a bit. I think we're fine. And let's look at two more quantum numbers. And those are spin angular momentum. And spin angular momentum um, is separate from orbital angular momentum. Uh, we'll find out that there are ways of combining that so that uh, when we're looking at electron states in atoms and molecules, remember the wave functions we're coming up with apply to the electrons. Um, when we're looking at those electron states, um, there's going to be a certain amount of orbital angular momentum, but the electron carries with it an intrinsic amount of angular momentum all the time. This is something that's a, a little mysterious uh, in particle physics, is that each of the fundamental particles in nature just has a certain amount of built-in angular momentum. Now classically, we think, well, is the particle spinning? But we really don't represent it in terms of trajectories. We kind of just say, hey, it's just there. The angular momentum is it's just there. It's part of the particle. So in any case, electrons, and you may have heard this in chemistry classes or physical science classes, the electrons in atoms, uh, electrons anywhere actually, they don't have to be in atoms, can be uh, in one of two spin states. And we refer to that as spin up and spin down. Now in terms of the quantum numbers, what we do then is we define two quantum numbers, S and m sub s um, as the magnitude of spin and the uh, one component or the orientation of the spin. Uh, the total amount of spin, now this is a quantum number, this is a quantum number, this is amount of spin orbital angular momentum and it's given by little s, s plus one square root uh, h bar. Uh, so what I've done is I just copied the formula from over here. So kind of an interesting feature of, or, of angular momentum. There is angular momentum associated with how the electron is interacting with the nucleus. And there's angular momentum that's intrinsic to the electron itself that it carries with it everywhere. And they actually follow the same formulas. So uh, when the electron is interacting with the nucleus, there are a number of ways in which the electron could have angular uh, momentum. The intrinsic angular momentum just has one value. So for an electron, little s is always equal to one half. So you're thinking, hey, well, if s is always equal to one half, I can plug that in and I know how much spin angular momentum the electron has, and it's always going to have the same amount of spin. That's true. And as a result, in most textbooks, this gets left out. And they move right on to uh, looking at the uh, one component formula. Now, I can write that one down. 
So there's the one component formula. So again, if we want to make these two pictures just match each other really well, what we can do is say, this is giving us the magnitude of spin, and this is giving us one component So yeah, the two formulas, even though they seem to be different types of angular momentum, both are quantized, and both follow the same sets of formulas. Now, for the electron, since S is equal to 1, the electron is a spin half particle, turns out the proton is a spin half particle, the neutron is a spin half particle, the photon is a spin 1 particle. So you've got these half integer spins versus the, in, the uh, integer value spins, and we'll run into that later on, but for now, we just want to know what the values of the quantum states could be. Well, it turns out that if you have one half unit of angular momentum for your spin, there's only two possible orientations. And so the possible values for m sub s, is it m sub s down here, are plus a half and minus a half. So the values for the spin are, are quite restricted. Uh, there's just these certain values that the spin can have. Uh, S is always going to be 1 half. Uh, M sub S is either going to be plus a half or minus a half. And these, again, are referred to as spin up and spin down. And it's kind of arbitrary, uh, the axis along which the angular momentum, the, the spin up and spin down is being measured. Uh, so, for example, if we turn on a magnetic field, uh, electrons in that, electric, in that magnetic field are going to have their spins align with the field or against the field. So kind of spin up and spin down relative to the field. Now, if we rotate that magnetic field, uh, the electrons then have the possibility of falling into different quantum states, up or down, relative to the new orientation of the field. So what we do is we go, okay, whatever axis we're working in terms of, we're going to just write that down as the z-axis by convention. And so we refer to this as being S of z. That's one component. Uh, big S is the total amount of angular momentum. And these values are, are always going to follow this pattern. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to include this. So on midterm problems and whatever, uh, in addition to uh, the quantum numbers that are coming from the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is providing these three. Uh, this is kind of tacked on uh, because we know about the electron, well, experimentally we've discovered that the electron itself has its angular momentum. That needs to be included as part of the definition of the quantum states. So if I'm looking for uh, a set of quantum states in um, hydrogen, What I have to do is I have to specify these five quantum numbers. So it could be that I have an n value of 1. If the n is equal to 1, then L can only be 0. Uh, if L is equal to 0, then M sub L has to be 0. Because when we look at individual components of orbital, one component can't be larger than the total magnitude. So the M sub L values I guess we didn't get these written down, but now we will. Uh, they run from minus L all the way up to plus L. So that determines how many different orientations we can have for a given amount of angular momentum. So again, if we're looking at energy level one, uh, the only possible value for orbital angular momentum is zero. Only possible value for one component is also going to be zero. Now, when we look at the spin, Uh, the spin quantum number is always going to be one half, and the spin orientation is always going to be plus or minus one half. Okay. Now, uh, when L is equal to zero, we call that an S state. We'll see that there's names for all of these states. Uh, you know, people in physics and chemistry determined that. Uh, 
there weren't enough things to memorize already, so we gave all the states different names. Uh, if L is equal to zero, if there's no orbital angular momentum, we refer to that as an S state. So if I took these quantum numbers that I've listed right here, those refer to what we call the 1S states. And if I drew a line and labeled this line 1S, uh, you know, common representations for these spin up, spin down states would be spin up and spin down of two electrons uh, in that 1s state, the 1s telling me that n is equal to 1, the s telling me that l is equal to 0. Okay. We'll get back to some charts and outline this more. That's actually two electrons, not just one. The little arrows are keeping, uh, the little arrows are keeping track of orientations of spin. All right. Okay, that's probably a good place to uh, end the first half. So let's take a seven and a half minute uh, break and then we'll pick up again.